Thank you for your interest in this site. Let's get started. The modules provide a detailed and practical framework for how to react and respond to a loved one who is abusing substances. This is about what you can do, actions you can take to change the course that addiction is playing in your life and the life of your loved one who's struggling. Whether they've never thought to quit or they're just coming out of treatment, headed for a relapse or maintaining their sobriety, this is the essential skill set you need when someone you love suffers from addiction. This program is designed to get your loved one into treatment, to reduce their use, and to make sure you take good care of yourself. There are a couple of important points I want to make about drug and alcohol problems. If your loved one gets physically violent towards you or the children or an elderly parent, as I explained in the opening comments, this program is not for you. We ask you to make changes in how you're interacting with your loved one. And while these changes are designed to calm things down and to be respectful of your loved one, there's no guarantee that this will happen. If your loved one tends towards physical violence directed at you or the children, do not follow this program. You need tailored help to deal with the violence first. Do not follow our suggestions for changing your behavior and go to the supplement for help. You may be asking yourself whether or not your loved one has a problem with alcohol or drugs. Well, there are almost as many experts out there as there are definitions of problem use. The simplest definition is to ask yourself whether your loved one's use is causing problems. The problems may be subtle ones. So for instance, perhaps your loved one's pot smoking causes her to not finish tasks or to be so passive she doesn't even start the task. Is your loved one overly focused on alcohol or a drug? to the detriment of other things in their life? A related question is whether or not your loved one has to abstain from all use for all time. The answer may be no. The literature on moderation to alcohol makes the case that for some people who have not yet stepped over the line into a pervasive pattern of abuse, I'll say that again, a pervasive pattern of abuse, moderation of their use may work. If your loved one thinks this is the case for them and wants to try moderation, you may want to go along with it. We provide instruction in the supplement on how to alter the directions in the main modules so as to support your loved one's efforts at moderation. My hunch is that most of you on this site are here because there is something seriously wrong with your loved one's behavior around alcohol and drugs. There will be little doubt in your mind that their problem is so serious that solving it is going to involve abstaining from alcohol and drugs. Even if your loved one wants to try moderation to alcohol or to anything else for that matter, but turns out to be wrong and abstinence is truly the answer for them, trying moderation for a short time and failing may help them realize the need to abstain. One more thing about this approach. When I present, people are often skeptical that this approach will not work on the hardcore user, the heroin addict or the really chronic alcoholic. I had one participant at a workshop tell me that this approach seems designed for the Cosby family. What I told him is that even when physically dependent on a drug, there are moments when it's a full out party and the aim is to get high, and moments when the aim is to just avoid withdrawals and to maintain. Nowhere is this more true than with heroin or other opiate users. It has now become, com become common for many to use street-bought Suboxone, a legally prescribed drug that helps with cravings and withdrawals from opiates, as a way to coast through periods when they can't get their drug or want to clean up for something they have to do or want to do. For the alcoholic, it may be that they drink 3.2 beer as a way to maintain. The supplement provides instruction on how to modify this work if your loved one is using around the clock. I see three stages to any drug and alcohol problem. 
The first stage is when your loved one has no intention of stopping. It might be said that they use with abandon. Simply put, there is no problem. The second is when they've noticed that taking a drug or drinking may be a problem, so they start making changes to their behavior, like switching to wine from hard liquor or only doing cocaine on weekends. I like to think of these small changes as small experiments in getting sober. They often don't work because the problem is actually much bigger than they first realize. But these experiments provide critically important opportunities for learning about their addiction. With each successive failure, these experiments provide a growing recognition that the problem is bigger and harder to resolve than they first thought. The third stage is when they get that resolve and commit to stopping. Now they're having periods of abstinence, perhaps even long periods, with maybe the rare and ever, ever briefer relapse, along with an emotional commitment to living a sober life. If we were to graph this trajectory for getting sober, it might look like this. In the center of the graph, the use is intense, but as the circle unwinds, there are more efforts to control the use and smaller periods of abstinence with longer relapses. As the circle finishes unwinding, the relapses are shorter, abstinence is longer, and finally there's abstinence without relapse. The bad news is that some people will get to stage three and resolve to stop, only to give up and go back to using with abandon or to ineffective efforts at controlling their use as described in the second stage. This is what makes drug and alcohol problems so confounding and infuriating. Yet I don't believe all is lost if you see your loved one going backwards. When they've recognized the need to quit once, as we described in stage three, they never entirely forget the problem is serious, even as they slide back to what looks like use with abandon or smallish efforts at control. Somewhere in their thinking is the knowledge that the alcohol or drug is the problem. Knowing how to react to your loved one, how to set up anew using the skills in this program, will move them more quickly towards stage three again and a resolve to quit. Understanding what's going on and knowing how to respond is key. It's what you can do. It's what will keep you calmer. There's a saying in Al-Anon, you didn't cause it, you can't control it, and you can't cure it. In short, you are not responsible for the alcohol and drug problem. This program helps you take charge of the part you can control, your part in the relationship. By improving on what you say and do, you help foster a solution. We all influence one another all the time. You have influence. By fine-tuning your influence, you create an environment more conducive to getting into treatment and recovery. What I'm about to say is very important, so please listen carefully. In order to be effective with your loved one, you have to stop your efforts at controlling them. Controlling someone is, in effect, a way of dominating. You're frustrated and scared, so you make demands. But has it worked? You make a demand and your loved one ignores it. You get resentful or angry. You try to guilt them or shame them. It turns out that controlling, threatening, and insisting do not work. What does work is using your influence. So what is the difference between control and influence? Here's a chart that describes the difference between the two. By using your influence rather than trying to control, you push the responsibility for the substance use onto your loved one. Rather than demanding, which is a form of controlling, you request, which is a form of influence. The control is understandable. You have your good reasons about how the situation can be improved. You feel compelled to voice your good reasons. Maybe they say no directly and clearly, 
or they say no in a more hidden way by not doing it. If you get a no and you're angry and you want to guilt them, that's how you know you made a demand and not a request. If you had truly made a request and you get a no, then your reply would be empathy, curiosity. So I see that you didn't do as we agreed. I'm wondering if you felt pressured or worried or embarrassed. I'm not saying be a doormat. I'm saying you can't control your loved one. You can voice a request that's being assertive. Accepting their answer is also being assertive. The no answer is information about where your loved one is at the moment. You may be disappointed, but you leave it alone. Using only influence means you are partnering with your loved one as opposed to powering over them. It's the difference between saying something like, I'd like to see this happen, but I can't force it, or drink and you're out of here. If you get a no, you prepare to set up and try again at another moment. Module 8 on how to get your loved one into treatment explains how to know when the moment is right. You are a partner in this effort to help. You are an ally. Your role is to have information on treatment resources, to support non-use, and to step away when there's use. Your job as fixer, protector, police person, and advisor is over. The only enabling you'll want to do is helping your loved one to get into treatment. What we lay out for you in this site is not rocket science. It's based on the best of science and psychology. Changing how, ha how you have been reacting, oftentimes for many, many years, is not easy. We all behave in patterned ways in our lives. So take it in small steps. Try things that are easier at first. The situation you find yourself in took years to develop, and it isn't going to resolve itself overnight. But you can feel better about things very quickly. Even the smallest change can have immediate results and will reinforce you to keep going. Remember, there is a solution. So dig down and find that patience with yourself and with the one you love. What we lay out in this site is the most effective way to act when faced with drug and alcohol problems. Following our suggestions will help you put down what isn't working and put that energy towards what does. The modules are short and therefore easy to watch over and over. The key observations exercises become your file of all the important facts about your situation. Add to it, delete from it, refer to it when needed. The discussion is where you share your experience with others. I moderate it and provide my feedback. The sanctuary is where you go to find some peace and calm. It's a place to write your private thoughts about what has gone on, what it's like today, and what your hopes are. We make it easy for you to copy anything you write privately and paste it to the discussion or send it to a friend via a confidential email. There is a set of questions that we ask over and over as a way to track your progress. We graph those responses so that you can easily see how you're doing with things like worry or stress or hopefulness. This is education, it's not therapy. If you find yourself stuck, too emotionally upset to do this work, and if our segment on hard feelings and the links in the supplement don't help, it may mean you need support from a therapist. The situation you are in is incredibly difficult. Drug and alcohol problems create chaos, lies, and deceit. Trust evaporates. It can leave you spent, incredibly angry, sad, and anxious. Simply put, it's not fair. So take a deep breath, take a look at this site, and commit to trying what we suggest. If necessary, pull in therapeutic help. This is about your loved one, but it's also fundamentally about your own well-being. 
This work flows from one overarching and central question. Is your loved one using right now, in this present moment, or are they not using? How you answer that question determines what you say and how you act. What you say and how you say it is covered in Module 4, How Do I Talk to My Loved One? How you act is covered in Modules 5 and 6, My Loved One Isn't Using Right Now, Now What? and My Loved One Is Using Right Now, Now What? We also want your loved one to get help. Getting help is the single most important thing you can do to stop the addiction process. We cover this in Module 8, How to Get My Loved One Into Treatment. There are two more things you must know. The first, it's critical that you stay safe. This is covered in Module 2, How Do I Stay Safe? The second is you'll also want to take care of yourself. This is covered in Module 7, How Do I Care for Myself When Negative Feelings Get in the Way? These two items are so important that in addition to devoting an entire module to them, I also make comments on these throughout the other modules. Across the top of the page, you'll see a pull-down menu called Supplement. Here you'll find the very best links we've identified to help you jumpstart your self-care. Strong emotions stop you from thinking clearly. Negative emotions are to be expected when you love someone who struggles with addiction. We need you calm and centered to do this work. Getting there is at the heart of self-care. There is no set order to how you should view things, but whatever you do, please view the safety module first. Safety is key, both safety for yourself, other family members, and your loved one. We've gone to great lengths to make this website clear and straightforward. The hope is that you see quickly how the pieces fit together, how improving your communication sets the stage for calming things down. How behaving differently sends signals that things have shifted. You're no longer going to prop anything up. There is a rhythm to the work. Step in when there isn't use. Step away when you see use. There are dozens of small things you can do that improve your connection with your loved one and set the stage for talking about getting help. And there are windows of opportunity when you should talk about treatment and other times when it is pointless to do so. This isn't tough love or simply detaching from your loved one. You can't control substance use, but you can control how you react to it. You can control some of the conditions that exist when you're involved and line things up towards stopping the use. With Allies in Recovery, you're not alone. Together, we can move your loved one towards recovery.